Welcome to Impact Makers Radio, featuring industry thought leaders sharing problem-solving insights to help grow your business and live the life you love. And here's your host, Stuart Andrew Alexander. Hi, everyone, and welcome to the show. Hope everybody's okay out there. This is Stuart Andrew Alexander, back again with another exciting show. Now, our guest today is on the other end of the line and waiting to enlighten us with some of his knowledge, some of his tips, and some some of his great insights. But before I bring him on, allow me to quickly share some information about him, and then we'll have him on to the show. Now, today's guest is a global executive forward-thinking, idea-driven technology professional with a history of leading organizations and inspiring teams to achieve unparalleled results in technology transformation and business performance. He's a leader committed to developing people and implementing business models and technology solutions that change the way customers view an organization trust its reputation, and use its products and services. He has proven expertise in defining business operations in America, APAC, Europe, and Latin America. And he's here today, ladies and gentlemen, to talk about some of the problems and some of the obstacles and misconceptions surrounding multinational and multicultural teams and companies. So, With that said, and without any further ado, let's welcome him onto the show, technology executive, Philippe Dagula. Philippe, welcome, my friend. Are you there? Yes, I'm right here, Stuart. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for this introduction and for inviting me for your great show. It's a true honor and a pleasure to have the opportunity to talk to you. I am honored to have you on the show, Philippe, and I do believe you are right now in Singapore. Is that correct? Exactly, exactly. I just came from several, let's say, travels around here, APAC, visiting team members and so on. Exactly. Right now I'm based here in, in Singapore. Well, we truly are an international crowd today. You're in Singapore, and I'm speaking to you from a location in Cairo. So, hey, this is the international crew today. Let's have some fun. Philippe, let's just set the tone for the rest of the show. And if you could just briefly describe who is your perfect prospect, or in other words, who is it that you help, Philippe? Well, I think, Stuart, the best way to say... um I don't know if you've ever heard about Darwin's statement, so it's not the strongest one that survives, the most adaptable one. So my my key is to help companies and individuals to be more adaptable to change and then help them to drive their growth, especially right now in digital initiatives. So make basically, I help them to show how important to always be adaptable to change fast. Right, and when I look at your um, your profile um, that you have online, Philippe, you've done a whole host of things. You have a lot of experience, and but I'm sure that while you're out there helping these companies to be more adaptable and to change and drive their growth strategies and their operations, you come across some common obstacles that are preventing them from achieving their desired outcomes. Could you just expand a little bit on what those common obstacles are that you come across sometimes? Absolutely. I think, well, Stuart, you, you saw how much the, the technology changed our lives in, in the last 10 years or last 20 years. So basically right now everything is so fast the time that we spend to learn or to learn a new thing or to adapt to a new thing, it's, it's totally different. So I like to say the common obstacles, I call the triple constraints obstacles. So basically uh, the way that the companies usually like to think in the past how to change from a new technology or a new product was very top-down related and not only top-down related but they think the change only came to a new product or a new project and sometimes they miss that the key thing that every time you design a new product you design a new service or you have any internal initiative in your company you always should reassess 
the organization of Shark, your award and recognition model for your employees. If you don't change that, if you don't change the way that you uh, evaluate and you provide career to people, you cannot expect from outside you're going to be successful in how you're going to launch your services and products. So the first thing or the triple constraint is the fast change adoption. How we do that? The second one it's obvious the experience. I, I'm not saying the experience is not important, but I think in the past, the the main driver for change or the main driver when you decide to do something, you leverage too much only in in experience. And this is not enough. As I said, the previous one, the, you need people who is flexible and are open to understand the change and embrace the change in a company. And the last one, again, as I said, it's the people and career development. In several companies, in several companies, that, that, the countries that I work for, many times, many projects or product launches weren't successful because basically we miss the opportunity to reassess how is the career of these people. How can we link what we want to launch for our customers, for what our team members want to do in a short and long term? How are they going to be rewarded? So if you don't link these pieces, you're basically just producing, producing, and not taking advantage of that change. So every organizational change must be followed by a career model review. Mm, so obviously there are a lot more common obstacles that you meet out there, right? But um, these three that you've that you've mentioned are obviously really important. So you just um, highlighted fast change adoption. Um, you spoke about experience and people and people needing to be more flexible. And then you spoke about career development. Can we just look at that point of career development just a little bit deeper and maybe bring in an example of how you have dealt with that obstacle in a company, obviously without naming the name of the company because of um, client confidentiality. But can you just go a little bit deeper into that for us, please, Felipe? Absolutely. Let, let me give you one, one example. So when you are leading a global team, so right now we have a, basically like you and I right now, right? we are different countries we're having this business conversation here. And uh, it's part of our world right now, have international teams and multicultural teams. So, um, and usually uh, the normal way that the people do and the companies understand, they say, oh, I have a team from cost reasons, I have this specifically technical skills, for example, outsource for a country where it's cheaper to have this kind of work, right? So basically you start to distribute your team in terms of silos of knowledge. So, okay, so I have a team in this country responsible for this task because probably it's more technical or because there it demands more technical skills. This is will be for this counter become demands more management because I'm close to my customers or close of my key stakeholders in the company. And I think this is this is a problem because when you need to scale a business and we need to create a cohesive team, you need to think cross. So the the original way that uh, many, many years we design our organization of sharks in companies, the the classical design, right? You have the let's say the C level, the directors, the management. So that tree view that's that's not the way that we do business anymore. So when you when you access a team, you always have to try to plan how we're going to define cross interactions with this team. So for example, if you have a team responsible for your technical operations and a team responsible for your management with stakeholders, you should assign specifically roles inside the same team for cross responsibilities. For example, you can have someone responsible for operations across all your countries or across all your operations without leaving behind the role, right? Because the role is still something that is there in the company. So you still could be, uh, let's say, an uh, IT manager, but maybe you also could be a cross role from an operations manager for a specific team. So that's the only way that you can increase communication between two members. You can show a path if someone, for example, doesn't want to follow a specific track in terms of people management, but likes more uh, expertise track. So you always should try to review the way that you organize your teams not only thinking anymore in the traditional organizational structure, okay, okay, this is my boss, this is my second level, we have a lot of informal network of communications inside and outside the company that you have to address. 
Now, one of the things that I always say to my guests when they come on the show is your job is just to be the educator and the advocate. Don't come on my show and try to sell yourself. We're not interested in that because our listeners want to hear about their problems and the obstacles. And I just love the way how you address that one particular problem of career development. But my job also is to be the voice of the listeners. So with that said, I'm going to ask you a rather, let's say a cheeky, I'm going to be a little bit cheeky and just uh, put my neck on the line and ask you this question on behalf of the listeners. You obviously are very experienced in what you do and have a proven track record. But on behalf of our listeners, Philippe, what is your magic ability? I mean, why why should they even listen to Philippe de Gula? Well, it's a, it's a good, I like it. I like that, Stuart. It's a very good point. So I would like to say, Stuart, I, everything that I, that I do... Um, my magic expert ability, it's, it's, it's based in, in also in three pillars. Probably you notice I, I'm a huge fan of the number three. So <laughs> I think mm. it, well, the, the three pillars are always apply for a lot of things. So first is cultural shaping. Um, Stuart, what, what I'm really trying to say to this, I, I came from a simple family, Stuart, from, from Brazil. I started to work with 17 years old and my father was a small business owner and he always taught me how important you learn and you listen to people. I think when you start to grow in your career and I had great mentors, great executives, but I also had some experience that people, well, I'm here. So I learned a lot. So they don't listen anymore. So I think when you, when you work in different countries in different cultures, you, you have to, let's say 80% to listen to the people in 20% acting. And I think when you talk about career development, when you talk about to drive changes in the companies, if you always try to do the top down, if you always try to bring only your experience, if you don't listen, that will be very, very, very difficult. And that's, that's I think it's uh, such a simple thing that if you don't build this connection with your team members, you're not going to be able to do that. So I'll say before to do any action, do the 820 rule. So go listen a lot. And based on their input, apply your experience, but also apply everything that you need. The other one, it's the bottom-up change management. I, I truly believe any change, any project, any product design, any product launch, you have to engage your team. And I think sometimes um, the best way to engage your team is when you bring them on on the initiative. For example, uh, every time I want to launch a um, a new project or a new initiative for my team members, even if it's local or globally, I always bring them on to lead one of these initiatives because I'm not expecting they'll be the experts. I'm not expecting they will have all the answers, but I do expect they will be able to understand the challenge because if you bring them in, they will understand why you are making those decisions, why you are being transparent. And they will see, I'm here to learn. So they will see the value of that. So I think it, everyone should be, a mentor, even inside or outside the company, you always should take care of the people's career. You always should make decisions a little bit uncomfortable for you to allow other people to grow. And based on my experience, I'm glad, Stuart, to look behind and see the people that I help to grow in their careers and change companies and so on. Okay, Philippe, so we've spoken about the companies and individuals that need to be more adaptable to change and to drive their growth and strategies and operations so that they can lead more digital changes. You also touched on people needing to be more flexible and you just spoke about some of your own capabilities in terms of the three pillars, your own proven system, this cultural shaping, listening and learning, and bottom-up change management. However, while you're out there and talking to these companies, talking to these individuals, what are some of the popular misconceptions that you come across that are preventing them from achieving their desired outcomes? Could you touch on some of those aspects for us, please, Felipe? Sure, absolutely. I think first one is the time, let's say this way. I think uh, in one hand, let's say in one hand, we are requesting the people being very adaptable to change and change fast, learn fast, but in 
to some extent, at the same time, we don't have the patience anymore, right? We are not patient anymore to wait to see the results. And that's, that's one of the key, I would say that's the key thing, because when you change something in a company, when you change a process, when you design a new product, when you implement a new project, what is the right time, right? See, and I think the main mistake, I think many times the people don't, don't wait. And I think that you have to wait at least six months. Obviously, you have to put in place some key KPIs, but before six months, it's very complicated. You have a clear understanding and a view of what you did. So I, I've seen many cases, companies trying to rush to say, well, but we changed that, but after three months it's not working, you have to change again. And then they enter in this loop of constant change, but they are, you are never letting the people learn and you are lear- you're not learning about the process. And you are learning from their customers. So I think that's the first very crucial point. I think Take your time when you change something. Please wait uh, at least, let's say, four to six months. K- take your KPIs and then review after that. But don't don't rush. Don't rush. The second one, also very common, especially let's say more traditional companies, when they want to change something, they think it's all about, uh, uh, let's say, communication and uh, top-down ownership, right? So, so my boss is saying this is important. And it's came from top down. And uh, that's also a huge problem because I'm not saying this is not going to work. But all I can tell you is when you do this, your change is going to take much more time. So that's why, as I said before, I really recommend when you want to do something, even if it's something very sensible at company level or implement a new product or service, bring it on people from the low level. So bring them on. So because they're going to have the majority of the questions. They're going to have, they going to at the end deliver what you are requesting to them. So if you bring them early, you're going to have more inputs and you're going to show them. We don't want only the questions, but we also want to participate in the solutions. The fourth one, I would say you need experts, right? So I think basically for many, many years, we, we still are learning for all these changes, right, Stuart? The technology completely changed our lives and we still have the mindset from the past. If you see a doctor, if you see a lawyer, should be someone with a more senior face or years of experience. So, so that's, that's what is important, right? And I think we have seen right now all these startups uh, creating amazing products and disrupting many others. So don't believe to do a change or to be creative or to design a new product, you need an expert. I think they are important, but what you really need is people willing to do mistakes and learn. So I think that's very important because in the past you think maybe I can bring here the best experts and I'm going to have the best product, the best service. But it is not the true anymore because the knowledge is right now is not in the people's minds anymore. The knowledge right now, it's in Internet. It's in our mobile phones, in this conversation that you and I are having right now. So your knowledge is not in the people's heads anymore. So I think these are the top three stories. Okay, you know what's really interesting, Felipe? As I interview different entrepreneurs from different industries, I notice this pattern when it comes to the misconceptions that they are across the board. Whether I interview a personal coach or a motivational coach, whether it's a healthy living expert or someone like you from the technology industry, there always seems to be this commonalities amongst the misconceptions of one time People feel they don't have time or they don't want to give it enough time to mature and to see the results. And two, I always hear you don't need an expert. I really find that interesting how you have these commonalities across all of these different industries. Is that something that you've come across yourself or could you add anything to that? Because there may be some listeners who are outside of the technology industry that are listening to this, Philippe. But in a very simple way, right? When you work in technology, I think right now you have, let's say, two two paths, right? Or you're gonna mm-hmm. be an intra- or you're gonna create your own company and be an entrepreneur, or you wanna, let's say, work in a in a big company and lead the technology, be a CIO of that company. So that basically, you have these two paths, right? And then, and then it's funny because, as you say, right? The people said, well, if I'm have an entrepreneur spirit. I I don't want to be the expert. I'm young, so I should go more to this path. 
or no, I like more the career model, long term, so I like the corporate world. But I think I, I don't agree very much with that because I, I particularly think I, 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 I think if you apply your entrepreneur spirit in a smart way inside a big company, I think you're going to have a clear advantage. I mean, uh, I always have this mindset because I think every time I join to a company, I think the main, in a big company, you should deliver, right? So I, I've been working in many teams where uh, you could have a great idea, you could have an amazing strategy and an amazing brain, but if you're not able to convert that in a good execution, doesn't matter, right? Because that's that's the way it works, not only in corporate world, but in their life. So uh, what defines a good or bad idea is just a good delivery, right? It's a so if you deliver well and if successful, that's, that's the difference. So I think you can apply the entrepreneurship in a big company. And I think that could be a key differentiation for you. So every time you have a good idea or innovation idea, so don't don't try to create a castle. So create a house, deliver the house first. Show true delivery. So I, I really encourage, especially the new generations, um, because I, I made my career in, in big companies in several countries, but I've always been coaching uh, several uh, startups in different countries. But that's that's exactly my point. I think I can. It's how can you balance the innovation with the ex- execution? And I think that's the future. And I think that's the new kind of professional that we want to build in the future. So a good and perfect balance between be innovative, be creative, but also understand how from a great idea, create a flawless execution and build a team that is able to do that. Thank you so much for that, Philippe. You put that so eloquently that I'm sure our listeners out there are going to be like, you know something, this Philippe guy, he's pretty smart dude. I am kind of <laughs> like the way how he puts things together in such a simplified way, but it's like a, a straight arrow going straight to the target. So thank you so much for that. On that note, yeah. Philippe, you consult with companies, like you said, um, companies on a large scale you consult with startup companies and sometimes you may be out there and you're having a good conversation and everything's going in the right direction and you're thinking to yourself yes this is going to be my next client you're ticking the boxes in your head you know that they need your help and you can see the plan in your head you can see the pathway of exactly how you're going to take them from where they are today to where they need to be okay you know exactly how you're going to make that transformation for them but then at the last moment they turn around and say to you philip hey this all sounds great but we're just not going to move ahead with this so why is it that people that you can help the most the people you have a passion around helping why is it that they just don't end up buying from you or taking on your services it's a great question, Stuart. I think, let me tell you, I this example that you gave, I think I learned in a hard way, okay? I think I, I had several experiences in the past and the beginning of my career, which was basically like this, right? So oh, this looks like the perfect project, the perfect assessment for this client, the perfect product. But then when you go there, it's nice, but it's not exactly what we were expecting. So, or, well, it's not the moment. So... For this, the, the thing that I learned and goes back what I mentioned to you before, I think I can say two things about that. So the first one is when you want to do something, the first thing is to gain trust. And to gain trust of people, it's, it's not easy, right? It's, it's not easy at all. So you, you have and to gain trust of people sometimes, you have to do things which is maybe not exactly your final goal. Maybe to gain trust of people, what I really have to do is help that person or help that executive to do something that's going to say, okay, I can listen to you and I trust you. I can tell you that in my second job, I remember the way that I had interest from a very famous CIO was basically, I, had to, I was doing a project with him. I was pushing him to approve my, the, the, the documents of the assessment, a strategic project. And, but he asked me, he actually mentioned to me in a coffee, well, I have to finish this presentation for my CEO and I don't have any help. And then I say, well, uh, maybe I can help him. I'm good with the Excel. I'm good with that PowerPoint. Maybe I can help him. Then I, I just offer help. And basically, literally, was that kind of trust that created each other. Because we had to work together in that presentation until late night. 
uh, he was very helpful. Nothing attached to my work. Nothing attached to what, what, uh, what I had to do. But that connection built the trust. Built the trust that allowed me many, many years ago, uh, basically move from when I became manager the first time to create a business with basically in that particular moment with more than five million. So trust is fundamental. And I think if you don't build trust, forget other things. Forget your goal. If you only have your goal in your mind, if you don't have how you're going to build trust, you're not going to reach your goal. So think first, how are we going to build the trust? That's the first. The second one is don't try again to build a castle. So if you want something, the best way to reach what you want is go in small pieces. Go in small doses. Go step by step. Show, learn from your small mistakes. So don't try to put the perfect thing at the first shot because you're going to be frustrated and you see doing your own way everything could change based because of your customers, maybe because of your team members, but always try to make small goals. Okay. If you define small goals, your team and your client, they will see the value. They have their, your trust and they see the small goals that they, they, they can see the results. You're going to get it. Philippe, I think you've proven hands down that you're you're the man to help companies and individuals to be more adaptable to change and to drive their growth strategies and operations to lead digital changes. I'm convinced and I'm sure the listeners out there are convinced as well. But here's the thing, Philippe. Who are you? I mean, we don't know much about Philippe de Gula. We know you you know your, your your industry. You're a very clever guy. We know that you've got this amazing accent, and we also know that you're a very good looking, you know, James Bond type of guy. I've seen your picture on LinkedIn. There's no denying this. All right, but having said that, Philippe, okay. Who are you? Like, give me give me something about your backstory, just briefly. What what led you to this field? You know, what inspired you? Was it a movie? Was it a person, a family member? Please, just short, brief, um, look into your backstory. Uh, I like it. It was very, very good, Stuart. <laughs> I actually, when I had a bad day at work, I'm going to listen this part over and over again because I'm always going to have a bad day when I listen to it. have to it. So it's good. Uh, well... I mean, as I say, right, sir, I came, I came from a, like, from a simple country. I came, I came from Brazil. I, I basically started to work in IT, in technology with 17 years old. Um, mainly for two reasons. Basically, I need to work because if I don't work, I don't want to be able to, to pay my university. Um, and also, totally, totally honest with you, I never liked to go to the school. I, I always thought the school wasn't very meaningful. So I said, I think if I go to work in a company and so on, there are going to be some meaningful things. I'm going to learn more. And then I started to work early. I started in IT early. I, was, I think I, I can consider to some extent I was lucky to start my career in IT. I'm really passionate about technology. I've been working in different technologies in different countries in such a diverse environment. So um, I really love that. But I think that uh, everything came from my father. I think my father was a, was a very small business owner and always uh, gave me important lessons. And I think these lessons plus my, my passion for, for technology was mm -hmm. the key drive for, for my career. So my, my father was very care about their, his team members and how to help them to grow and learn, um, how to listen and respect the customers. And so he basically taught me about the trust. So how is it important to you build trust and how you build trust with your customers, with your clients, with your stakeholders. And, and my father never said, I want you to be the best. I just want, my father always say, I just expect you be someone that can leave a message. It's something minimal for, from, from the people that work to you. So um, I really have a thing that I do. It's a, uh, a lot of my father and a lot of the passion that I have for, for technology. And I truly believe technology uh, can make other people's lives better. I came from a simple country. Right now I'm here in Asia. And I love to see how much we can do for a small business, for simple people who has been connected for the first time in the Internet. So really passionate about that. Really, really passionate about how technology mm. can change people's lives. 
Philippe, I want you to imagine you sat in your car and you're looking back in the rear view mirror of your career. And I'd like you to think about one of the companies that you have helped to achieve the promise that you made them, the the promise of being able to become more adaptable to change and to drive their growth and strategies and operations to lead digital changes. Can you name just one of those prospects that you worked with or one of those clients, better said, um, so that we can just get a feel of some of the results that you've achieved? I know there are many of them, but just briefly, just one of them, please. Well, I mean, I firm, let's say, for (laughs) confidentiality reasons, I cannot give the name, but I can give you, for example, what I was in America before I came here in APAC right now. I can tell you one of the projects, one of the initiatives and projects that I that, that I did at Herald and my responsibility, we increased more than 80% the margins for that particular business line. And we increased the efficiency in more than 10% with the team members. So basically, we're using all the techniques that I mentioned to you before. So that's clear results that are there, the people know, and clearly results that you can measure and see uh, after this, all these techniques apply in, in a right way. And could you attribute those successes back to the three pillars that you mentioned earlier on of cultural shaping, listening and learning, and bottom-up change management? Absolutely. And on top of that, definitely the trust. because. If I did not create the trust with those key executives, they are never going to allow me to implement those three pillars. So that's why, again, build the trust. When you have the trust, and again, the trust uh, could be a small thing that is going to make you build the trust, but Mm -hmm. build it. When you have it, apply the pillars, and you're going to see the results qualitative in a quantitative way. Okay, so the client you just mentioned, increased revenue of 80%, profit margin 7%, expanded service availability of 10%, and you boosted their efficiency by 30%, a massive change, a massive improvement. But it's all very dry. It's all very much numbers. Tell me, Philippe, and for the listeners out there, when you think back, again, looking back through the rear view mirror of this particular project, how did it make you feel? Well, I think it made me feel satisfied because I think you, you are where you live behind, right? And I think when I still talk with my clients, these clients specifically, my team members, we still have the contacts, right? You, you preserve these this, this contacts because you, you pass a lot of good and bad things together and you preserve these contacts for, for many, many years. So I look behind it, I can say they still use the techniques, they still value what you did for them, and they value sometimes even more when you're not there, right? So they, they still call you and ask you, say, wow, I remember that, and that was really changing for us uh, from a right. customer perspective, that active for people's perspective. So I think that's the value, and the people will look back and reapply the things that you did. Yeah, but Philip, how did it actually make you feel? I mean, you think back, is it pride? Is it some sense of happiness, fulfillment? Come on, work with me here, Philippe. Come on, get out of that technology mindset. Get into that. <laughs> you to connect with that sensitive, uh, emotional guy. You can't be so good looking and not be emotional. So come on, how does it make you feel? Our listeners want to know. <laughs> I, 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 will say, I will say one word because it's usually the word that my people always associate with me. Definitely it's happy. Definitely it's happy. I think it, it, it. I look behind and it's happiness. <laughs> I'm a, I, I definitely happy is the, is the final word for me. I mean, I always have good sense of humor with my team members and I, look, I like to look at the things in a happy way. So that's definitely the word. <laughs> Perfect. And that makes me feel happy too, Philippe. Thank you so much for sharing that. (laughs) So listen, we are running out of time. I I could sit here and talk with you all day, my friend, really. I would just feel like we're just warming up, you know. But unfortunately, we're coming towards the end of the show. So let me just ask you this. If there is a listener out there, obviously several listeners out there that are tuning into this show, And they're thinking to themselves, yes, he's a great looking guy. Yes, he's got a sexy voice. But beyond all of that, 
He knows what he's talking about. And I think this guy can come into our company and make the changes happen. Teach us how to be more adaptable to change and to drive the growth of our company. Teach us how to do that. I think we need his help. If that's the case, Philippe, where can people actually find you? How can they get in touch with you? How can they connect with you? Well, Stuart, I'm a very active on LinkedIn. I think it's a, it's, a, it's a good platform to connect. Actually, I have several posts there in my profile. You have my contacts. I think if you, learn, you want to learn a little bit more about me, I like to mix a little bit between business and personal things, movies. So I think it's a very entertaining reading. But definitely LinkedIn. I think it's the, the main contact in source for, for me. I recommend to go there, take a look at my post profile, and more than glad to connect and share and experience it. And, and obviously learn because you always have to learn more. Okay, so let's go through the process. They go to LinkedIn.com. Exactly. And then in my profile, basically, it, it, it's very simple. So you can you can search on my profile, Felipe Daguila. So F-E-L-I-P-E-D-A-G-U-L-A. Um, and you'll be very, very easy to, to, to find that. Perfect. And I will ensure that your contact details go alongside the show notes. Unfortunately, like I said before, Felipe, we have come to the end of the show. It's been a lot of fun. It's been educational. It has been informational. So I thank you so much for that. And I thank you so much for taking our time out of your busy day right there in Singapore to come and talk with the listeners. So before I leave, do you have any final thoughts for our listeners out there, Philippe? Well, I think uh, I'd like to say thank you very much, Stuart. I reviewed your show and so on. Great initiative, very innovative. I like the, the way that you drive the show. I, I participate in other workshops and so on and shows and definitely very engaging. I like the personal touch. Very good job. I'm very, very happy to participate. It's a, it's a true honor. And for the listeners, again, very happy to, I know we spent some time listening to my points here. Any connection, any question, more than glad to answer. And again, remember to build trust with everyone around you. Thank you for tuning in to Impact Makers Radio. To listen to all past, present and future industry thought leaders and trendsetters, visit us at impactmakersradio.com.